And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from... Coming to a straight, coming to us straight from, and I can't, I can't believe I screwed things up. Coming to us straight, <laughs> straight from sure. Aaliyah Publishing Group, and the and the mastermind behind the card-based iconic adventuring system, which is currently funding on Kickstarter. The one and only Joshua Raynak. How are you doing today, man? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. So, I'd like to open up. At the humble beginnings, in a sense. Sure. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what was it that made it stick? Okay. Um, well, I, when I was about 12 or so, this is back in, I don't know, 1986, mm -hmm. um, I had a group of older friends. They were like anywhere from, I guess, 16 to 18 in the neighborhood and they played Dungeons and Dragons and when and uh, you know I hung out with them they allowed me to play with them you know I made a character and I was hooked from day one and so then I scrambled my money together uh, begged my stepmom to go to the Walden's books at the time and pick up the red box the starter the starter box Mm -hmm. And um, and when I came home one day after school, there it was on my bed, and that was it. I mean, and I gathered some more friends together and just started uh, started gaming and and some grid paper and started making dungeons. Mm -hmm. Now, were you did you jump did you jump around with between between a bunch of different systems or did you largely stick within the Dungeons and Dragons umbrella over the years? So when I was younger, it was mainly just Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you know, limited access when you're 12, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. you just go to the go to the mall when you could, go to go to Walden, see what new books, possibly new adventures. I didn't do a lot of adventures. We had our group of friends. I would do a dungeon, and then whoever else did a dungeon next. And then and then I think when the Wilderness Campaign Guide came out, it just opened up our world. It's like, oh, we just we can do other things besides dungeons. <laughs> and, and so we, then we started creating kind of worlds and towns and, and stuff like that uh, in, between, in between our little dungeon uh, encounters. And as I got older... That's when we started really, you know, when I was out on my own and, and, and doing whatever I wanted to do, you know, uh, that's when I started discovering other other systems uh, or even other campaign settings. I mean, uh, I think my senior year in high school, I, I got into Dark Sun really heavy, mm -hmm. big Dark Sun fan and played, played it up until its demise and even continued onward with the early... Uh, web support that it had at the time and and then we just kind of moved back into you know other systems and uh deadlands vampire mm -hmm. uh, cthulhu i played with a little bit of anything mm -hmm. uh, i never really got my hands on gurps or anything like that or traveler but i i've, I've read through the rule systems and stuff like that and since you mentioned gurps i'd br i'd break out a um I get. I guess the. I guess you. I guess you not dipping too much into Gurps isn't too surprising because I don't see you carrying around a TI eighty three anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had. I had some friends that that really loved the system, and you know, I may have made a character or two like long ago. Uh, and of course, you know, when I was in the bookstore, anything new that came out, I, I perused it yeah. and see if I could implement it somehow you know yeah i don't i don't hate gurps i just like giving some some of the people in the church in the church of gurps a a, a fair amount of shit <laughs> because 
yeah. of the whole. Oh, was, oh, GURPS is the only game you ever need. Yeah, kind, kind of, kind of logic. Um, yeah, no, I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, I've heard, I've I've heard, heard it before, before, and um, that's kind, that's kind of like that's that's kind of like that's kind of like saying that a that um a certain car, that a certain I'm trying to I'm trying to think of a car a car example I could I could use though that that um all you all you need is an all you need is an SUV right um but of course if I want if I want to use another example I could I could go with um the only re- the only restaurant you need to eat out at is is a buffet yeah <laughs> Well, you know, it's so funny because, uh, you know, I don't necessarily think it's any one system. It's just those experiences that you have uh, with your close friends at the time. And, you know, and if everybody's playing GURPS, the GURPS seems magical to you, you know. Uh, You kind of get into those moments and those memorable role play experiences that, you know, it doesn't really it doesn't really matter about the system. But since everybody's playing GURPS at the time or or Dark Sun or, you know, Dungeons and Dragons or whatever. That's that's that connection that mm. kind of fills that void, you know. I think. Yeah, it's the it's it's reminiscent of the whole v- fun with friends thing. Which yeah, I'm not saying that isn't the case, but um, sure. The li- but the line "fun with friends" doesn't exactly tell one a whole one a whole lot from an outside perspective. Which no, it doesn't. Someone's, if someone's looking at rev- at reviews or the like to see to see what kind of ge- what kind of game they'd want to bring into their table. Um, yes. saying it's fun with friends is the most milk toast thing you could say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's one of those kind of you had to be there incidents, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, as I um, I could jo- I could joke that I tr- that I treat um, I treat people who swear who I treat that kind of people who swear by GURPS the same way I treat people who um co- who constantly sing praises of the. 1911 as far as pistols. Yeah. I mean that's not that's not to say I don't like it. I just like it. I just like giving some of its owners who t- who um who act like it's the it's the most perfect thing ever. Um I like picking on them. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, sure. And even when it comes to tabletop gurps isn't my big whipping boy. That will always be rift. <laughs> Oh yeah, riffs. I yeah, I've had a few few friends that really enjoyed riffs as well. I like riffs setting. I don't like messing with the Palladium system. Yeah, and I especially don't like messing with the books because navigation is a pain, and navigation is the one hill I will die on. But you had mentioned you had mentioned. Um, you had mentioned doing a whole lot of stuff with Dark Sun. Did you ever do anything with Spelljammer? Uh, no, not really. I, you know, Spelljammer was always a curiosity for me, you know, especially cruising through uh, Dragon and Dungeon Magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just never had any friends that really uh, played. So I'm kind of excited for the, the system setting to come out, and I want to take a look at that and really explore it. I yeah. am. I am looking for. I am looking forward to Wizards disappointing me again. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I probably would be more excited. I probably would be more excited about spe- about Spelljammer if Dark Matter didn't exist. Yeah. Um, but that that's just me. I've. No, I've... I, I, I get, yeah, I get it. I mean, uh, when Fourth Edition uh, did the Dark Sun campaign setting, I was really excited that they were going to expand upon the world because they were very limited before about you know the areas and not all the cities had even been mapped out in the you know at the at the time and and so i was i was excited and you know it was it was it was what it was Mm -hmm. you know i enjoyed it i enjoyed it for what it was but to me it wasn't it didn't have that dark sun feel to it so um i think If I'm being if I'm being uh, if I'm being honest, I try I try to av- I try to avoid feel whenever I co- whenever I cover stuff because of how broad that it it, sure. uh, it can lean very very much into that whole you had to be there kind of thing. 
Yeah, um, no, I do. I think I think in the case of something like Dark Sun, the 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 overall the overall problem was putting it out there and not and not and not following up. Yeah. Um. Of course, I'd say I'd say a bigger problem is people having a bottlenecked attitude regarding fantasy, but that's a whole other matter. Sure. Um, <laughs> In that same vein, did you ever dip into Al Quadim? Because that's the other hidden gem from the AD and D era. Yeah, I did uh, dip into Al Quadim uh, because, of course, it was desert-like. So when I was running, you know, Dark Sun campaigns, you know, I would I would dip a little bit into Al Quadim, or their products caught my eye, and I would see whether I could homebrew stuff from there into, into uh, dark sun. Um, I remember use, I remember abusing spell thieves a lot when it came to that setting. Yeah, I think I had, I think there was a, there might've been a one or two players in my dark sun campaign that, that, that were spell thieves as well. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is quite a jump to go from, (laughs) More, to go from more traditional styles of play to a style of play that is de- that is definitely uh, that is definitely on the outside of what of what's expected mm-hmm. when it comes to u- when it comes to utilizing cards and utilizing a deck building system. Um, yeah. So how did that how did that come about with the idea of tr- of wanting to do a deck building um, based system for an RPG? So I played uh, board games on Monday night at my local game shop. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is when Magic was kind of dying down. It was just me and one other guy. We used to play some group games of Magic. And and we were like, well, let's hit the board game table. And so we started playing board games there Monday nights. And along comes Dominion at at one point. Mm -hmm. And the first time that I played Dominion, I was like, how is this game working? I'm not sure. But then all of a sudden it clicked. And I became obsessed with Dominion. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I like the idea behind it. This deck building thing, building your deck as you're playing. And I, I think it was, so I, I started, at the time, I think I was trying to kind of develop a role-playing system using an old um, collectible card game called uh, Dark Age. They have a really unique uh, dice system Mm -hmm. as a part of that collectible card game. And I had gotten permission to use that system, you know, not that you copyright rules, but uh, from the creator. And I was kind of gearing toward that. So I I had already planned on maybe using cards at some point because it used cards. And I like the idea of having an NPC just on a card that that could be easy for... uh, a game master. I like that. They had some similar mechanics sort of like that with Deadlands where you use cards as well. Um, so I had that even before Dominion, I had this kind of idea, uh, you know, cards with RPGs as long as it was thematic. I mean, when Deadlands came out and I was like, man, you can do this with maybe tarot cards or something, you know, more of a medieval fantasy landscape or something. And so it got my brain working that direction. But when Dominion came out, I really loved Dominion. And I think when uh, Star Realms, it was another deck builder because now when once Dominion opened at the gate, you had a flood of you know deck building games coming out. Mm-hmm. And Star Realms was one of the ones that I think really intrigued me uh, because the way the setup was, you basically have a a set of five or six uh, decks in front of you, and when you take an action, you choose one of those cards on from that from that deck, and that's kind of what your action is for that round. Uh, and then it goes to your deck, and that's when I was like, I can do a role playing game like this, you know, where you're just choosing from the center stacks if you want to, you know, as you're building your deck, if you're doing a strength action or an agility action or you know, uh, that's the, that's the action you choose for that turn if that's what you want to do. And so, uh, you kind of start building your deck that way as you're doing encounters. Mm -hmm. And, um, 
and then uh and then another big influence i think was the mage knight uh game as well it had a deck building element in there as well and where wounds kind of clogged your hand and and so um those two things really got me started thinking about how i can do this now the star realms format that went away i didn't i didn't use any of that and and went to more of a traditional kind of you know deck build where you you start off with a, 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 yeah. a deck and you add to it but um but I got a lot of ideas from Mage Knight as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it is funny that you bring up tarot cards when when discussing this kind of thing because, well, every way exists. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, uh, every you know, you know, I was around when every way was. I, I believe every way was a Wizards of the Coast uh, foray yeah. into role playing, and um, and it didn't uh, it didn't hit. You know, it kind of took a nosedive. And I'm interested to see what's going to happen with the resurgence of it. But when I went to decide this is what I want to do, I, you know, I scoured, I went back and found the old heavy ray rules, um, the saga system for Dragonlance, anything that used cards, even board games that kind of used cards, deck building games that used cards. And I kind of just kind of scoured to see, you know, how they use that system and, and if there are fun things about it, can I implement it, implement it into what I'm doing? And so I, I really just, uh, that every way was one of those, one of those ones, you know, there's, there's a few recent additions when it comes to that kind of, when it comes to the idea of using cards in RPGs that I'd like to, I'd like to toss a few names at you and see if, and see if these were names that were at, that were on your research pile when you were developing. Sure. Um, parcelings. Yeah, I've never heard of parcelings. Um, that one's also a that one's also a a card based deck builder. Although it takes a lot more influ it takes a lot more influence from Mage. Okay. It's not as broken as Mage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I realize that's a low bar. I realize call ma saying Mage and broken in the same phrase in the same words is um, <laughs> low bar, but still. Um, Saga Machine. No. Mm -mm. Um, that's used in stuff like Against the Dark Yogi, Shadows Over Soul, and um, Dime Adventures. Okay. Um, but I know, but I've, I've had the, I've had the developer of that on, and that was blatantly, um, taking its cues from the old Saga system in Dragonlance Fifth Age and. The other, more the other Marvel RPG that TSR did, mm. the one before Marvel got it in their head. Oh yeah, that's was... that's yeah, that's right. Yeah, I did, I did, uh, I do have a PDF of uh, of that system as well. Yeah, um, this one isn't out yet, but it was making the rounds on Kickstarter a few months a few months ago. Um, Necrobiotic. No, I haven't heard of Necrobiotic. And. The last one that the last one, which is being published by Modiphius, um, Legends of Avalon. No. Uh, I guess I guess the key thing with this is that while 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 it while there's certainly while it's certainly still a rarity, that I'd say that there's more and more um, de designers taking the card idea card idea in their own ways these days than there was in the past and yeah when it comes to everway um i have compared everway to the, to the shape of punk to come album by refused <laughs> or if i need to use a more american example because refused is a swedish punk band um pinkerton by weezer okay in in both instances they were <laughs> A lot of people cite a lot of people cite both as as very good albums or or very influential. Now, that wasn't the case that that wasn't the case no. at the time. No, no. Um, the shape of punk to come was massively controversial, and some some outlets refused to review it because they didn't see it as being punk. Yeah. Well, I mean, with every way, and I, you know, I don't. You know, I, I have it in my, uh, you know, I, I have it 
available to me, but I haven't looked at it in a while. But um, uh, one of the things that every way, I mean, you had, I mean, at the time, TSR was king. You know, Magic was king in its field, and it just wanted it wanted to, and so they had to take it in a whole different direction. You had to, you had to make something, you know, new and you know out of the box. And I think every way did that, but at the same time. I don't feel like it had the crunchiness that 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 most people really desired at the time, you know. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the reason why you see a slew of um, narrativist developers who cite, who cited as that as that particular style became more and more prominent. Since in the '90s, it was all about add add charts to everything, everything. Sure. Yeah. I've had people ask me why. Yeah. Is, why is it that most of the games you co you cover are for, are aren't from aren't from before the two thousands? Because there's a lot of nineties yeah. games that are my whipping boys. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> the closest that I've come to 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 dipping into them is when I mentioned the first time somebody tried to take Alien and turn that into an RPG with the um, Aliens Adventure game. Mm. Um, it was not good. <laughs> <laughs> it was using the rule set with Phoenix Command, which I have, which I have frequently stated, I will not run Phoenix Command ever again unless I'm paid. Mm. It was way too crunchy for its own good, is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course, all yeah. of, all of those games from Fantasy Games Unlimited haven't exactly held up with age either. Yeah. But. Given that, given that, when it comes to the when it comes to the system, um, like we, I, I had noticed the I had noticed the different the different types of cards, and one thing one thing that I'm curious about is with is um how is what the relationship is between the, between the value of an attribute on your character sheet. And the and the at and the attribute and the attribute cards. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you have five stats: uh, agility, charm, uh, insight, strength, and willpower. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if you have a four agility, you have four agility cards in your deck. Mm -hmm. And now, agility cards themselves don't have any number they just have the agility symbol on them um just like the strength card has just the strength icon on them mm -hmm. so if you have a, a three strength then you have three strength cards in your deck so you kind of always know what cards you have in hand what cards are in your deck what cards are in your discard pile mm -hmm. that's best for one. Second is that the number is a tool for your GM to use as like an arbitrary number, uh, so or or the rules. So like, you know, with when you're, let's say, an example, if you have if you're gathering mana and you're putting it into your reservoir, which is sort of like in your play area, immediate play area, <clears throat> and mana cards used to power magic and and that sort of thing. Uh, you can only have so much will, uh, mana card in your reservoir equal to your willpower score. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, if you say, hey, can I get, you know, or, you know, hey, can I uh, get some, you know, I'm an influential noble, I want to get some of these uh, ragamuffin, you know, players that, that travel with me uh, into the, the banquet, you know, the DM could say, okay, you've got a charm of three, you can get three of your friends in. You know, the other ones are going to have to find a different way. So it's a, it's kind of a tool so you can, they can use it as arbitrary number to kind of, you know, set, set limits or uh, that kind of thing. Also, uh, adding both scores up. Um, so if you have, uh, I think fitness is, um, is a combination of agility and strength mm -hmm. that gives you, that gives you your fitness score, which then determines your hand size uh, when you're trying to perform a fitness task. 
And so those are how the kind of numbers are used. Um, there might be a time where uh, a GM might say, okay, you need a willpower three to get through this uh, for a, a test or like if you're doing like a saving throw, speaking in D&D &D terms. Uh, and if you have a willpower of three, then you just need to discard one willpower card. If you have a dis if you have a willpower of two, then you might have to discard two willpower cards. Mm -hmm. So they're all they're also equal to. So every if you have four agility, you have four agility cards in your deck. Each of those agility cards have a rank of four. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm g now when it comes to skills, um, is it a is it a case? What would what would the skit what would um how would skills impact a at the action resolution regarding this relationship with hand size and what cards you're actually going to be using? Sure. So skills uh, do a couple of things. Um, one of the things that they do is they can give you an advantage, mm -hmm. and that basically says you know um, they're they're not they're not they improve the chance to succeed rather than kind of being a task in and of themselves. So you're not going to make a stealth check, but what you're going to do is you might take, you might, you know, the game master might ask you to do a fitness task. And if you can justify how you can use stealth, you'll draw an extra card for that task. So it increases your hand size by one. Uh, and that's what advantage does. Another thing that, um, you know, uh, a skill can do is if you're just like, well, I want to kind of sneak up to the camp and, you know, kind of just take a look around. I'm not actually going inside the camp. I just want to see you know, if I can count a number of guards or whatever. You know, the DM might, I mean, the game master might say, you know, you're trained in stealth. You do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I know you've got the training. There's no need to make a ton of checks. You're not doing anything super risky. You just you automatically do it, and this is the information you get. And that progresses the story forward. You know, of course, the, the player, the GM can talk about, you know, how that's happening and how that's playing out and role-playing it. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing that a skill can do is uh, can give you an automatic success by using a fee card. So the first one was just the GM being nice. If you have a nice GM and just saying you, you're trained in it, I, I get it. Hmm. The other one might say, okay, I can, you know, I, I need you to make a task for this. If you're going to go sneak into the camp, you know, if you're going to sneak into the camp, you can make a task. Now, you can make a normal task. The player can make a normal task and get the advantage of the extra card. But if he has a feat card available, and a feat is like an extraordinary act, mm -hmm. and he's trained in stealth, he can discard that feat card and say, I'm not, I'm going to just pass this task automatically. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know the you know the game master would want to know you know well what are you doing and how you're doing it in that role play. Yeah. Uh, and if you're not skilled, you can still do that, uh, but you're going to have to spend extra fee cards to do that. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then if you want to use that arbitrary number again, um, back you know before uh, with your you want to relate it back to your thing, you can say, well, me and this other guy is going to do it. And he's not trained in stealth. And the game master can say, well, you know, what's your, he could say, what's your insight? And he could say, well, you know, it's two. Well, well, then you can, you can bring him along and kind of instruct him, you know, how to do it. And then the game master might say, you can, you have to spend a fee or, you know, or so forth and so on. So mm -hmm. that's the kind of free form, but you know, that you might get with a narrative game, but it also has a, a backbone that the GM could fall on to make sure it's not abused. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, that brings me to... Given the, given the fact that a lot of games that use, a di that use a die system will usually have a difficulty that you have to overcome in some form, whether it be roll high, roll low, roll close in the... Yeah. Form, in the in something like Fading Suns or something to that extent. Sure. Uh, how how would a G, how would a GM make an encounter 
more or less difficult within the iconic system? Okay. So um, when I first designed the um, iconic system at the time, it was called Genesis. Um, it did have like a difficulty number system. Uh, it's like I was tra trapped inside that box. But as I started moving away from numbers and doing things more visually, uh, such as just matching icons, I had to figure out a way how to do that, uh, especially based on your hand size. Um, and that went through some iterations as well. But the, the system, now that it's done, uh, you determine difficulty um, this way. Uh, there's, there's, I'll just give you an idea. Um, they have different degrees. So if you have a diff difficulty of challenging, um, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to draw two stress cards because the challenging says to draw two, two stress cards. Mm -hmm. These are cards that kind of clog up your hand. They're only there for that task. At the end of the task, you're discarding them. You're forsaking them, removing them from the game, essentially. Um, but it, but if you have a fitness score of six and you've got um, two stress cards in your hand, you're only drawing four cards because you only have a limit of, of six. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. So that kind of brings you to the real world factor. Like this is stressful. And um, the second thing is the fate icons. So challenging has a fate icon score of three. Mm -hmm. So that means that when the game master flips over the fate card from the fate deck, um, if it has three, I three icons or more, then that's the only fate card that they draw. If it has one or two icons on that card, then the game master draws an additional card until the three icons are met. Mm -hmm. uh, total number of icons are met. And that's it. Uh, and so the player has to match uh, those icons that are shown on the card. And each card that they play, they kind of describe the hindrances and obstacles that, um, that they are trying to uh, overcome or the actions that they're taking. Uh, and they can be very cinematic, they, you know, they can be very, you know, sort of like, you know, I flip over the table, you know, or I swing from a chandelier, you know, drop on the table. Mm -hmm. It allows them to kind of tell those triumphs, but it also allows them to tell that ep those epic failures, you know, too. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I I swing from the chandelier, but I, I don't have an agility card, the, the weight of the chandelier gets what you know gives gives way i crash on the table but i managed to get up and you know mm -hmm. fight now uh monsters do have aptitude scores um and uh so if if you have uh um a monster's aptitude like if their you know their fight score is 10 or 12 then that would be a challenge you know that would equal a challenging degree of difficulty so that's mm -hmm. where you go from there all right and with that in with that in mind, one of the things that I also noticed was the concept of, of momentum being one of the, I'd say one of the three types of extra effort resources that could be utilized. Um, yeah. The, the other two being feet and quest. Obviously, not exa yeah. not exactly the same, but extra effort resource is a um is a is a broad strokes term that I use. Sure. Um, but unlike the, unlike the other two, momentum is a shared resource. And I'm curious, what was your reasoning for making momentum a shared thing? So, um, I like the idea of having a group dynamic and, um, some of the things you'll see in the core rules when they come out, um, is that, um, I'm really focusing on how players interact with each other. Mm -hmm. I liked how other systems did it. Um, you know, I, you know, when Numenera came out, I liked how they kind of tied other players to kind of together, you know, uh, if that's what, you know, the players kind of wanted. And so, uh, having momentum as a group resource, um, I thought was just, um, a must given my other thing. So to give you, give you an, an idea, I liked the idea that 
if you if if people or characters are traveling as a group, they're going to learn things from each other. And so one of the things I want to express is that um, during downtime, uh, if a you know a wizard's memorizing spells and the thief's kind of interested, there's no reason why he can't pick up a few of those tricks of the trade from the from the mage. You know, speaking in Dungeons and Dragons terms. Uh, if somebody has a feat uh, in the group, um, you know, it might, you know, you might allow somebody who doesn't have the prerequisites to forego those prerequisites because somebody in the group is training them, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I like that. And this, and the card system also wanted to make sure that during combat, players could you know, play cards and actions from their hand to help other players. Mm -hmm. Um, And because, again, everybody's in a group dynamic, nobody's static where it's like, well, I attack, well, I get plus two because he's flanking. Yeah, sure. But where's where's the fun in that? I mean, um, you're just adding stats and then rolling a die. Uh, You know, for me, I wanted, you know, someone to say, well, I'm throwing the dagger at him while that guy's attacking. Mm Mm-hmm. Or, um, you know, I'm trying to cast a, you know, spell and, and this is what I'm doing. I'm playing my action cards. But of course, if you play your action cards on somebody else's turn, when it comes to your turn, you're not going to have many action cards to do whatever you want to do. So momentum, I thought just kind of built into that, uh, player dynamic. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, I think, uh, the, the, um, I don't think it's the latest iteration. I don't know if they have a new iteration or not of the 40k role playing game, but they use something um, something similar in, in, in that as well. The, I'm assuming if you're talking about the the latest iteration, I'm assuming you're talking about Wrath and Glory. Yes, yes, yeah. And yeah, yeah. they actually they and much like with, much like with um, Fantasy Roleplay Fourth Edition, they actually have multiple ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, and uh, also I think Thirteenth Age uses the escalation die, and yes. uh, I, I like that concept as well. There's a lot of stuff I, in thir- in Thirteenth Age I absolutely love. Um, yeah, including the fact that it managed to make a bard not suck for once. <laughs> yeah, well, and you see that's the that's the thing too. Um, you know, not everything has to you know resolve into a uh, I attack that thing gets damaged and so forth and so on. If if one player character is, you know, strumming an inspirational, you know, inspirational tune on a on their on their um, lyre or whatever mm-hmm. or lyre, uh, they can do that and still add momentum to the group, you know, inspiring the fighter, you know. So it's not all about um, let's get this monster down to zero hit points as quick as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh and it's fun. It's funny you mention the the whole I I attack I the whole I attack thing because I've I've been very very critical of the basic attack trap that martial characters can get into. It's part of the it's part of the reason why I why a lot of old school style games I I can't really get into because of how they treat martial characters. Um. I know. I know. There's gonna be. A, I know some people will bring up the whole holdings thing or multiple attacks. Um, that's lipstick on a pig to me. Yeah. Uh, doesn't matter if you're doing. Fo- doesn't matter if you're doing a single or doing a dozen basic attacks. You're still doing basic attack. Mm-hmm. And you uh, and you also have. And um, you ha- you end up having this perspect this um perception. Of the fighter being Babby's first character, yeah. Which... Well, well, the the problem with the problem with um, I think you know fighters, uh, the class in general, and you know I I agree with you. You know, I mean, one of the things I encourage uh, players to do in my in in when I'm playing fifth edition or any other is just you know before just say just rolling a dice and saying I'm attacking. Tell me how you're attacking. You know, what are you doing? Are you are you bashing them with your... I know you're using your sword, but, you know, a sword could be used in so many different ways uh, by thrusting and, you know, hacking and overhand 
you know, attacks, uh, you know, bashing with the pommel, you know, describe to me what you're doing, you know, uh, it's not going to change the damage on the rope on the sword, you know, but just, just tell me what you're doing. And that's, that's helped play a lot. But the problem I think overall was the fighter is they're really good at melee, which is great. But in order to keep them really good at melee, you kind of have to have the other players not so great at melee, or the other character classes not so great at melee. I they have to be yeah they have to be good in other ways, but they can't be good in melee. The ar- the um argument the selling point seems to have always been that they can use any kind of weapon. Yeah, which I find to be a cold comfort when. Most people aren't going to be using every kind of weapon. They're going to find one particular, one or two particular um, equipment styles and largely stick to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, like if if somebody if somebody's going sword and board, the there's the idea that they can equip any kind of weapon is not all that appealing. Right. Uh, and in my opinion, I've always found the concept of I always found the concept of fighter. To be too broad. Yeah. Um, are you familiar at all with a get with a D twenty hack called Fantasy Craft? Nah. Mm-hmm. Um, which is a fascinating um, l- look. It basically blew up um, the rule set with three point five and rebuilt everything from the ground up. Okay. But it doesn't have a out and out fighter class in the traditional sense. Hmm. Um, it ha it's split. You have soldier, you have scout, you have la- you have lancer, um, and you have com- and you have commander. And because of the fact that you essentially have the good with weapons or good in melee kind of thing, and ne- none of these assume melee anyways. You have it split. You have it split multiple ways like that. You can. You have you have room for each of them to express themselves individually. Yeah. Uh, grant, granted, granted yeah. the the soldier still has a whole lot of the whole of the good with weapons thing, but sure. not only are they good with that, but they're also the best at main at maintaining them and getting them at a discount. Yeah. Uh I mean, there's there's no doubt about it. I mean, if you know, um, if you were a knight in the medieval age, you've been tr- you were trained since you were young, and so you were going to be um, exceptionally well, uh, especially with a certain number, of, you know, certain types of weapons uh, that nobility used, such as the long sword, mm-hmm. um, and uh, th- those as well uh, that normal peasants just couldn't get their hands on, or even you know. Um, even mercenaries, you know. Uh, so, so yeah, I definitely think a fighter should be able to shine, but um, but it has to be has to be more to just you know they have to shine outside the combat. I think as well, you know. Yeah, and we, or at the or at the very at the very least, um, just get just give them some because. An issue that I've an issue that I've talked about here on the show regarding the whole um, martial mage divide is the mm-hmm. latter, the latter getting more game out of the game, right? Instead of instead of each archetype, ideally each archetype should fundamentally change how an encounter is going to go, right? Um, but speaking of that, in with iconic, you have the mana cards. And yes. what I'm curious about is if is if is if you're treating mana at, is if you're treating spell casting as a somewhat freeform approach, or if you're mm-hmm. or if you have a li- or if you have a set of fire and forget spells to contend with. All right, so um, I have a little bit of both. So uh, it's one of the things when you're starting from the ground up, uh, you can you know you don't have those those tramping trappings like, you know, advancing and magic or something like that. So what, one of the things that I think I took a cue from, uh, was fourth edition. One of the things I liked about fourth edition was the ritual. 
and uh, where it more had more of a game effect rather than you know um, an attack, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So what I didn't like about it, it was just so hard for players to cast. I mean, and to get their hands on it, it was just the, the the goal ratio was really off. And uh, but I like the concept. I like the the you know being able to um, uh, have that. So so. I have rituals in my in iconic as well, and they are more of effects. So you know, bear. You know, if you were going to create a wall of stone, that'd be a perfect ritual, even on the battlefield. Or, um, you know, if you're going to do light, uh, that'd be a ritual. So something that has a game effect. Uh, things that that you're looking to attack, and you know, like. Um, magic missile or that kind of thing like that that is more free form and that's called hedge magic and the way hedge magic works is that you spend um mana cards from your reservoir and and they act as wild cards and once you use a mana card as a wild card um you kind of describe what you are doing uh you know if it's if you're using a fire mana, then are you using a, you know, a bolt of flame? Are you striking, you know, with a flame sword or, you know, these things that are fleeting and instantaneous, mm-hmm. uh, that you're, that you're adding to the attack, uh, using mana also grants the magic keyword. So, uh, along with the, the keyword of the, you know, so if you're attacking a troll, so to speak, um, you, you know, you might have the magic keyword, but if you're not using fire mana, you're not having that fire keyword as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's how that's how that works. Uh, and of course, using magic is very taxing. So either whether you're casting a ritual or you're using uh, mana cards, um, is going to require you re- resistance. So that basically means that you are going to be um, losing fatigue maybe getting stress cards, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then, so once the mana is used, it's going to go into your deck. Uh, it's going to go into your dick's card pile. And when you no longer have, just like in a normal deck building game, for those that aren't familiar, if you run out of cards to draw, um, then you have to reshuffle your deck to reshuffle your discard pile, basically to form a new character deck. Mm -hmm. And that's how you eventually get your mana back is when you draw them back into your hand. Yeah. Um, and then you can place it back into your reservoir. So I can eliminate. So it's almost it's like its own uh, mechanism for keeping time, sort of like a video game. You know, okay, you know, it's back. Man is back in your hand. You can use it now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, players who are um, who are eager to get mana back, but are not willing to wait for it in their hand, they can also invoke energy, which adds more mana to their reservoir. But you can suffer a mana surge uh, if you have too much mana because you're forced to put it in your reservoir. Um, it's kind of hard to explain. There is some complication because it is magic. Uh, but I want to, you know, when I'm watching movies and, you know, Gandalf needs light, he just makes light. And that's kind of what I want it to do. Uh, you know, I wanted players to experience that. Like, oh, I'm out of spell slots. And they did a good job in 5th edition, I think, with cantrips, but I wanted to kind of carry that over to the other spells as well. Yeah. You know, the kind of that idea. If I'm being if I'm being honest, I looked at cantrips like a bandage. <laughs> well, well, I mean, you know, to me, it's I, I can agree with you because when I, a, a little bit there because when I when I'm playing a druid or cleric or or wizard in the traditional sense, um, I barely ever run out of spells because I'm very judici- judicial about how I use the how I use my spells and when I use them. So I, I you know um, I'm a very calculated uh, 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 player. I mean I, I went ten levels without receiving a hit point of damage. So that that that'll tell you one thing, <laughs> you know. So uh, so I don't feel bad who just for people who just burn through their you know, but uh, burn through their spell slots. Uh, but um, for but me, you know, for me personally, um, and I will note that the the Vancian model with spell slots and the like has been has been one has been one of my whipping boys for sure. decades. Yeah, and 
a large reason for a large reason for that is in most in most set in most settings that Vancean model that model that's based yeah. on the works of Jack Vance yeah doesn't quite doesn't quite fit the style of fantasy that D, that D and D wants to do and that other fantasy right. games want want to do and right whether you have spell points or you know mana points or you know whatever you you know i um i'm i've oh. now we think with a f there's also there's also the issue of finding ways to rationalize preparing your spells in advance and then sure. forget and then forgetting them yes and for me personally something something that something that i that is that I would all I would always ask G, I would ask GMs at a young age and I would always get a don't question it kind of answer. Yes. Yeah. So that guy over there learn, learns his magic through study. That guy over there is born with it. That guy over there d made a deal with the devil to get his magic. Sure. Why are we all drawing from the, why are we all casting spells the same way? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and see, that, and that's one of the things that I, I, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to do. I, I, I love for characters, I mean, players in my game when, when I'm doing, you know, when I'm running a game. I, I want them to make those hard choices, whether or not do I wait for my mana to come back, or I really need this magic. Do I, do I risk having a mana surge by, by filling my deck with more mana by putting more in my reservoir, uh, and. Um, and so I love I love that kind of uh, uh, I love that kind of gray area, and I want players to make that choice, you know, um, and be able to have that that choice, but also build some sort of robust f system that you know at times they're going to get away with it, sometimes they're not, mm -hmm. and you know uh, whether they get away with it, it, it could lead to a really great triumph, you know, in those times that they. They don't get away with it. it. Just you know, it's 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 a story for the ages. You know, I'm I'm guessing that that um within the within the setup you within within the um setup that you have for um hedge magic, the book is going to yeah. have a handful of examples on on what on what sort of effects could effects would be tied to each each type of mana. Yes, yes. I, I definitely want to give ideas because you know, not everybody is uh, is is good at improvising. Not everybody is you know good at uh, you know coming up with these kind of creative ways. Um, you know, some you know, like I was saying before, you know, we were talking about fighters. Some people just like saying I attack and rolling some dice, and I'm I'm sure the people uh, you know playing iconic, they're just going to want to match their card. And then, and then not have to describe anything. Uh, and I've had some play testers like that, you know. And but but they're still there, and they're still having fun, and they're still getting their experience with their friends. So I mean, uh, any way you want to, you know, play it. But yeah, I mean, I'll definitely give examples. I mean, especially like you know. So if you use you know fire and earth together, are you making you know an obsidian blade? You know, one of volcanic glass. Uh, you know, um, I mean, how you know. Using if you're climbing a cliff and you use air mana, are you creating handholds? You know, if you're using air mana, is there a, is there a magical hand that's kind of like lifting you up? You know, made of, made of air. You know, so um, I kind of want to share those. You know, yeah. get people in that. Mm -hmm. And you know how you what given how you mentioned that um, difficulty can be expressed through adding stress. Um, yes. Would a similar kind of thing apply if somebody wanted to do a more dramatic effect with, uh, with their ma with their magic? Um, yeah. So each so going back to the rituals, um, going going back to the rituals per se. Uh, if you don't have the basically, if you have mana in your reservoir, you and something you know, a ritual costs three mana, and you have three mana to spend. Then you just discard the three mana. I mean, in the spells cast, uh, if you don't have the mana, then you are basically going to uh, try to uh, 
cast the spell without using that mana. And that is uh, more difficult. That each 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 spell has a difficulty, you know, level. The more challenging uh, spells, of course, the higher the difficulty. And there's where the stress kind of comes because you'll be drawing stress cards in your hand depending on the difficulty of the of the spell that you're trying to cast. Um, now you can offset that. There's another thing we were talking about the group dynamic earlier. Uh, one of the things that I really love in literature and in you know you know film and TV, fantasy film and TV, is where people can channel from other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love the idea that, um, you know, if you're if you're in a group and somebody else has got mana, you can borrow from their mana reservoir, you know, if, they, if they're willing to, to do it, to allow you all to cast more powerful spells. And uh, I like that idea. And so I've incorporated that in there as well. Um, now, so. are you talking borrowing or are you talking borrowing so basically (laughs) so so basically what happens is that um if you're borrowing from somebody else's mana pool or reservoir first of all you have to have the permission you can't just do it on well so if they say yes and this is how much you're gonna you know get it doesn't go into your deck it'll go into theirs just as if as if they spent it Mm -hmm. um so they'll eventually get it back uh but you know, uh, the cost is that, you know, they're able to together cast a uh, probably more powerful spell or a much needed spell at the moment. You know, that one person might know that ritual, but the other person doesn't. Um, so, so, yeah, it is it is kind of borrowing, but but then it does it does leave the other person without mana until it until it recycles through their deck. But, but with that, with that in mind, I I was gonna I was gonna segue into quest cards, but I feel I can't cover those without covering how character creation would work. Um, now I'm, obviously I'm not gonna go. Th- I don't want to go through a exhaustive step by step thing because nobody because none of us have that kind of time. But there are a few things that I'm curious about with um with character creation. One of them is um, ro- is the concept of roles. Would, right. Would a character role be akin to an archetype, like a starting package? Uh, yeah, so uh, if you're familiar with... So, I, I again, I, 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 you know, I... There's... I'm trying to think of how to explain it, because uh, I use two methods uh the the main method that i use is more of a um uh is more of the kind of savage worlds type of scenario where uh you know you're not necessarily making a you know barbarian in the traditional sense you're making the barbarian how you kind of want the barbarian to be and you can use those traditional tropes if you want, uh, but you're just kind of focused on the idea of that barbarian. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to choose like an archetype. Uh, an archetype is sort of like a personality trait. Um, the core rules has nine, but it's going to they're going to be expanded. Mm-hmm. Um, and it kind of gives you just the guidelines of how you want to role play your character. Are you this type of person? Are you this type of person? Are you a little bit of both? But it just offers some guidelines. It gives you kind of a keyword. So, you know, you may have to have that certain archetype to maybe unlock certain talents or, or you know, a.k.a. feats uh, in that sense. Uh, but so you get like a little and that and it's also kind of like because it's also sort of like the alignment system, I should I should say, because, again, it's like personality types, but it's not like a strict lawful. Are you good? Are you evil? Are you neutral? It's, it's sort of like, hey, this is what these types are more, you know, generalized. And then what you're going to do is you're going to pick a role. And those roles, um, you know, could be, uh, there's lots. So uh, you could, let's say, go back to the Barbarian. I'm going to go to the Barbarian. The Barbarian's going to make some skill suggestions, uh, just like you would have in, you know, 5th edition, uh, or maybe even your... Uh, 
your background, uh, you know, and these are kind of, you know, pick a couple from these skills then pick, you know, whatever you want from these other skills. And, and then it's going to have, um, you know, another kind of selection from your, from your aptitudes. So your, your 10 derived stats, you know, your fitness, your, um, stamina, you're going to have those. And so from there, you're going to select uh, a certain group, uh, depending on whatever, you know, role you pick. And that will allow you to basically do well, do even better in some of those type of tasks. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you're going to start an equipment and that kind of thing. And you, you may or may not have a special ability. So that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, now, however you decide to get your starting cards, that is up to you. So uh, if you want three agility cards, you're going to have three agility cards. You know, you're going to have, you get to pick whatever you can, you know, the, the, the 12 cards you kind of begin with. And, um, and that, again, the cards that you pick. So if I have four agility, I'm going to have four agility cards, but that's also going to be, you know, the score of four that will lead up to my, uh, one of my 10 aptitudes, the ones that feed off of uh, agility. Uh, so you can kind of know what you want to be good at. That's one aspect. The other aspect of it is when you gain, uh, we kind of created a, um, a kind of a back door, um, class system. And what I mean by that, it, you know, you can stop right there with the number one thing, you know, the, 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 the former description of characters. You pick your archetype, pick your role, pick your cards. You're good to go. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you pick your talents. That the talents are sort of like mini classes. They're the ones that are going to really kind of, you know, make you know your character. If you want them, you don't have to. You don't have to have any. Uh, if you want to be a magic user, uh, you're going to have to pick up gifted, uh, which allows you to do hedge magic. If you want to be a ritualist, you're going to have to pick up both gifted and uh, the ritualist uh, talent, Mm -hmm. which is going to leave you without any feats because during character creation, you have two feat cards. You can trade those feat cards in to get up to two talents. Uh, But then you don't have those automatic successes that you want. But, you know, I will tell you, and you might have, you know, you know, realized this during our conversation that, you know, having mana as wild cards is a pretty interest, you know, a pretty good, uh, you know, rule break right there. So without that, you know, without your feats, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have some mana cards. Mm-hmm. Um, so then the, the backdoor system is that when we begin to advance the system more, uh, I want to be able to take those cores and maybe say, okay, um, every time you level your character, every time you basically, I, I shouldn't say level because you don't really level on the system. What you do is you improve your character. So for every five quest cards, you basically turned in Mm -hmm. or you bank, uh, you basically, you know, forsake them, you move them from the game. And that's how you level your character by doing one of the improvements, uh, you know, gaining a fee card, uh, gaining a new talent or, you know, improving one of your stats, um, you know, making your agility a four to a five which increases your aptitudes. So that's kind of how you, you know, maybe gain a new proficiency or even, you know, there's, there's other things that I would like to include as well. Sort of like, you know, well, I want to, you know, get a house or I want to get a, you know, magic item that I've quested for, you know, and, uh, that kind of thing. So I've quested and I, I eventually found it. Uh, or I finally, you know, got the, the small keep that I've been, you know, aching, you know, poor. So those are, could also be quests or leveling, quote unquote, leveling rewards. Um, but so in the system, every time you do that, you gain one rank of renown. Mm-hmm. So if you've leveled your character, quote unquote, leveled your character five times, you have a renown at five. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of the backdoor leveling. So there might be things that say, okay, you can't take this talent to your, you know, you have a renown of five. Or when you have a renown of five, you can do this even better. You know, you might not have to, you know, spend a fee card to, to 
to parry with your shield, you could do it for free X amount of times or, you know, that kind of thing. So there is a backdoor system. You can, you know, the gamers, you know, the game masters and players can, can, um, when we advance to that portion of it, um, if they want to use it, then they can use it. Mm -hmm. Uh, If they want to stick with just, uh, you know, having that character dynamic where I'm just going to, uh, role play, uh, this, uh, the way I want to role play it, um, then they can do that too. Um, and uh, during play tests, we, I mean, you know, one of the things we did in their very early play testing before we had actual classes, um, I just said, you know, um, it, you know, when they're talking about their characters, I'm like, well, what do you want to, what do you want to play? Well, I want to play a barbarian. I want to play a, a major. I want to play a, this a druid. Mm-hmm. And just saying that when they were doing their tasks, having no abilities whatsoever, you know, you know, they would, you know, narrate, this is exactly what I'm doing. The barbarians raging up, smashing heads, you know, doing things that they wouldn't have done in D and D because, you know, um, well, if I don't attack with my, you know, great ax and I'm raging, but you know, I've had barbarian just basically, you know, headbutt somebody and, and, and get them down on the ground and start bashing their face in, you know, or, you know, the enemy's, uh, soldiers, uh, you know, so, or, you know, the druid, he'd be like, you, you know, he didn't have any mana, but he was role playing, you know, the whipping vines, you know, the trees coming to life and whipping the, uh, whipping the foe, mm-hmm. you know, and that's, that's, that's acceptable. I mean, that's, that's perfectly great. doesn't have the mana keyword. I mean, the magic keyword to it, but you can role play that, you know, and people I found were role playing their, their roles. And that I took that cue from the play testing. And I was like, well, let me explore that even more. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I shouldn't be putting people in boxes. This is how, this is what, you know, sorcerers can do and what they can't do. This is what, you know, wizards can do, but can't do. This is what fighters can do, but can't do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I think, I think uh, abilities kind of trap people into that kind of thing. One of the things I, I say about fourth edition um, I think the system was good, uh, and um, I designed a lot of uh, product for it that did really well. Uh, a lot of it did better than some of my third edition designs. Um, but I think the whole visualness of having boxes really just threw people for, a, I think, visually through a loop. I mean, if they laid it out in a different way, like in a traditional sense, and not have these these boxes it might have done better you know i think i don't know um, i'm 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 not i'm not so sh- i'm not so sure because i i remember i remember seeing some i remember seeing the um meltdowns in 2000 with the changes from with the changes that third edition was bringing about sure sure oh uh, even one of the more hilariously ironic of the, of them being People claiming that it was tur- that it was going to be turning D and D into Diablo, which is yeah. ironic because A D and D already had Diablo modules. Yes, they did. Yeah, and I have a few myself. <laughs> among so, among certain parts of the, of the of the of the community, there seems to be that there seems to be this idea that um, video that anything video game related is supposed to be treated as a dirty word, which yeah is funny because of things like the SSI games. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I've I've made I've made jokes about this about this kind of thing over the years to the point where I I had said the only re- the only reason I don't hate 4th edition is because the check bounced. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's that's largely that's largely because I um I find it I would find it absolutely hilarious that I'm to- that I'm told that some of the some of the things that I liked in fourth edition are in fifth, even though yeah. even though their presence in that is a case of missing the point. Um, yeah, hit dice being one of the one of the big examples of that. Yeah, and then when I see people putting it putting in hacks or wanting or saying that they want a more tactical take on on fifth edition, I'm like, you do realize you're basically making four e with a different coat of paint, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, whenever whenever I point that out, people get mad at me, and then I, and then I laugh. I'm like, what? What? 
What, all I did was tell the truth? <laughs> yeah. But... With the... But taking that, taking that into account, um... I was a bit curious as to the purplish card that I saw that I saw that I saw in the Kickstarter page because in in in, in a the fundamentals there wasn't anything like flaw cards and I'm guessing yeah. that's a that's a full size thing. Yeah, that's a that's an ex yeah that's a planned expansion. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's there's several planned expansions. Uh, I wanted to do the get the foundation done and uh but my mind still you know my mind still it never shuts off so uh one of the things that flaws do and i did uh a flaw and merit system i i think in fourth edition yeah uh for fourth edition um that that did very that did pretty well and i've always liked the concept of flaws you know in, in third edition and and um and also like in savage worlds and and and, and dead lands and and the like but um and and vampire so i i want to can kind of continue that I, I enjoy it so basically what a flaw is it's a feat card uh, it, it allows you to get one extra feat card that you might not normally be able to get because of um you know restrictions or you know you start off with two well, you can start off with two. You can actually start off with three if you decide to take a flaw. And what the feet card, what that you use it just like a normal feet card. So uh, you can do automatic automatic successes with it and everything you can do with a feet card. The problem is once it gets to your hand, it doesn't immediately go into play. And in order for you to play it, you have to do something that's part of your flaw you gotta you gotta role play it you know if, uh the example i think that's on the kickstarter page is, a, is an addiction mm -hmm. and and you know basically you're gonna have to if you're whatever substance you're addicted to you know you're gonna have to spend an action card from your hand discard an action card from your hand to to imbibe that you know that drink of liquor or or whatever you you know you want to inhale <clears throat> And then you can play your, you know, if you are claustrophobic, you might have to, you know, you, you might have to, uh, you might have to be outside in order to, you know, do it or afraid of the dark. You might, you know, you might have to get a decent light source in order to, so the, <clears throat> those are just examples. Again, it's still, in, you know, it's a planned expansion. It's not fully uh, uh, developed at this point, but that's the concept in order for you to p play your, uh, flaw card uh in, into play uh you have to kind of you know kind of it kind of role play that flaw um which should you know uh, because otherwise it, it's if you don't do it you're you're clogging up your your hand in your deck uh for future tasks because it won't you can't get rid of it and it's going to make your hand size smaller so that to me, I felt was intriguing, especially let's just say with addiction. Um, uh, you know, you see it there. You might want to play it because you're desperate to play it, or you, you know, you're, you know, this is, you know, bad things are going to happen. So I want to play it. Uh, you know, so I get a, a, a free success or, or or whatever else you want to use that feat card for. But do I? Because if it gets into my hand, and I don't, you know, nobody in the group. And I just drank my last, you know, my last keg of beer. I'm not going to be able to, once it gets in my hand, I'm not going to be able to play it until I, until I find something to drink. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is that kind of inner character, gray area, you know, gray area dilemma that I, that I, uh, that I, that I want to kind of, that atmosphere I kind of want to create with the system. Yeah, I can, I can certainly see it. Um, what are you shooting for as, a, as far as a page count for the basic rules and for the core rules? Well, the basic rules at the point at, at this point is, is, is roughly a hundred pages. Uh, uh, so the, the, you know, the basic rules are, 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 are done. Uh, there's a few things that, um, we're, uh, working on, uh, you know, adding more, I want to add more spells, mm -hmm. uh, and that, and the like. Um, so the game master section, uh, for the core rules, you know, there's there's a lot that I I like I want to say, um, 
and there's a there's a lot that I want to borrow, you know, aka steal from from other books that I've that I've really been influenced by. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'm if I'm able to put in my own words, and um, you know, it's sort of not just how to, you know, not just extra rules for the game master to deal with, but you know, what kind of style of gaming would you want to you know you want to be out? The one thing I want about the system is. I, I want it simplistic enough to where people can tinker with the rules and not have it broken. And it's, you know, and so um, I want it simple and complex at the same time. And that's, that's, that's hard to accomplish. So I'm, I'm going to try to kind of, it I want, sounds like you're aiming for crunch medium. Um, yeah. You know, I want like, you know, I, the, you know, I love the narrative systems i i do the the whole kind of diceless what you what you would call diceless role playing Mm -hmm. uh you know uh i do like it but they but they don't have enough substance i think you know you have to have a particular group and i want some hard i want that same feel i want that same narrative aspect but i want hard rules to kind of back up that uh narrative play Mm -hmm. and um and i want you know the game master guide so i don't know you know maybe 150 pages i thinking with the you know maybe 50 pages uh that might include you know you know monsters you know so people can you know play uh right out of the gate with just the core book um uh until a beastery is 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 formed uh more more detailed beastery um, sort of kind of how they did with third edition and, and some of the, you know, they introduced the, the player's handbook first and with, you know, uh, with just enough stuff to, you know, get, to get by until the monster manual came out, you know, mm-hmm. and that's kind of what I'm, I'm kind of hoping to do. Yeah. Um, and given what you mentioned about tweet about tweaking the rules, I'm guessing that that, that, that kind of tweak ability also would include, um, tweaking it to, em- to emulate other styles of fantasy yeah uh you know fantasy you know science fiction you know wild west genre i want to give examples of how the you know i definitely want to uh you know provide that to uh you know in later on you know i would love to you know do a science fiction i love i I do science fiction games uh you know i love that genre uh, I love Wild West. I mean, pirates. I mean, I love I love that all. But you know, but I do want you know game masters out of the gate to say, okay, I can do this and make these weapons this way, and you know, and kind of give examples and, and you know, and then through their own play experience, whether it works or it doesn't work. And I would love it if they shared it. You know, uh, that's one of the reasons why we're making the game OGL. Is I you know I'm a small publisher. And, um, I, I want to see what other publishers and, and other people can, can do with it, you know, as well. Uh, I want to be surprised and, you know, I want to discover things that I overlooked or I didn't see. Um, and to really kind of kick the tires of the system. I'm, I'm small. I can only do so much. Hmm. Um, you know, I can only produce so much. And so, you know, I want this, I, I do want the system, you know, to, uh, to be available for for for, for anybody. Mm-hmm. Well, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory. But it is encouraged. Yeah. Well, next time I'll 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 hook my <laughs> next time I'll hook myself up with a couple roaming cokes. <laughs> you know, uh, I've never been a roaming I've never been a rum and coke guy. Everybody does. Everybody does local beers around here. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I have a I have a cousin that uh, he's in the he's in the industry and he works with a small brewery. You know. And he, the way he talks about beer is like a sommelier talking about fine wine. It's really interesting to hear him talk about it. Yeah, I bl- I blame it on the I blame it on all the pub crawls. The only one the only one which I haven't done is the zombie pub crawl because I'm too lazy to dress like a zombie. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I am fully aware of the irony of that statement. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, I, and I, I got invited to a wine tasting once, and I, and I said, no, I have too much dignity. Yeah. <laughs> I think the only time I the only time I ever did red wine was when I was when I was dressing up as a vampire and I hated it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Red, red wine uh, takes takes some time to to get used to. I think um, spending some I spent a little time in France and and yeah. afterward I I actually started enjoying red wine which I never liked before. So it was kind of yeah, weird. I've, I've heard that I've heard that in some fo in some form or another. And whenever I hear about the whole acquired taste, I always say. If you punch someone in the balls enough time, eventually they'll become <laughs> numb to it. Yeah, that's that's about that's about right. Yeah, yeah. But and of course, with all that said, a sincere thanks also goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will yeah. be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But Bye, until dude. then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!